let's just start at the top then and kind of just work our way through. I, we will do every single one of these um, step by step, but we'll uh, definitely touch on as many as we can. So for this first one, we're being asked to identify the acid and the base and each of the conjugates. So what we need to think about and do here is we need to remember our definitions. So by definition, acids use H plus, bases gain H plus. Those are the Bronze to Lowry definitions of acid and base. And so we should be able to just from that information alone, we should be able to identify the conjugate pairs because we should be able to look at this and say, okay, H2O and H3O plus. I don't know which one's acid and which one's base, but I know that they're, they belong together because they're only a hydrogen apart. And NH4 plus, And NH3, I don't know which one's an acid and which one's a base, but I know that they belong together because they're only a hydrogen apart. And so that process itself is called identifying a conjugate pair. So just by identifying the two things that are alike, we know that they are a conjugate pair. And we know that one of them is an acid and one of them is a base because each conjugate pair has an acid and a base in it. So what we need to do is we need to start looking at what happened to go from one to the other. So the water had to have gained a hydrogen to turn into hydrogen. Bases gain hydrogen. So the base in this case must be the water. And if the base is the water, the conjugate would have to be an acid since it's a base. So if I identify the water as the base, the H3O plus has to be an acid because every conjugate pair has to have an acid and a base in it. So if I know which one the acid is, the other one has to be a base. Now, similarly, to go from NH4 plus ammonium ion to ammonia, I had to lose a hydrogen ion along the way. Acids need hydrogens. That would mean that the ammonium ion is an acid. And its conjugate, ammonia, would have to be a base. Because again, every conjugate pair has an acid and a base. So if I've identified the acid, the other thing has to be a base. So in this definition of acid and base, what we're looking for is where is the hydrogen going? How is it moving? If I can identify the one thing, I automatically know that the other thing is the opposite. So when I identify water as the base, that should have also identified that the ammonium was going to be the acid, because each side of the reaction is going to have an acid in the base, and each conjugate pair is going to have an acid in the base. So water is a base, ammonium ion is acid, hydronium is the conjugate acid. I can identify each side because I need to have one of each. And I can identify the conjugate pair because they're one apart, one hydrogen apart from each other.
Right. With that in mind, go ahead and try this second one here on your own. Identify the acid and the base between water and the bisulfate ion, and identify the conjugates. Go ahead and go. Right, walking around, a couple of good things. Most of you are identifying the pairs correctly. So the pairs in this case would have been water and hydroxide and the bisulfate ion and sulfuric acid. Those are the proper pairs. And most of you did that part correctly. Couple of things that we have to remember. Acid and base have to be on the reactive side. Conjugates are on the product side. So what some of you are doing is you're recognizing, okay, hydroxide is a base, I'm gonna label it as a base and make water the conjugate acid. You're kind of half right, but you're also half wrong because that's not how they appear in the reaction itself. Water is in fact an acid, 
And we know so because when it goes to hydroxide, it is losing the hydrogen as it does. And we know that acids lose hydrogen. So that makes water an acid. It makes the hydroxide ion its conjugate base. The other pair here, the bisulfate ion, is a base, and sulfuric acid is the conjugate. And again, the way that we know that is we can see that in the formula, the bisulfate has added a hydrogen. We went from HSO4 to H2SO4. So the formula has added a hydrogen along the way. So those are things that you want to be aware of, think about, take care of as you're going through and doing these kinds of examples. Now this third one, this third one is actually a kind of a trick question. Um, in this case, we are looking at the auto ionization of water. Water is going to make one conjugate pair this way and another conjugate pair here. In this particular instance, water is acting as both acid and base. The water in blue has added a hydrogen, so that would be the one that is actually basic, which makes the hydronium ion the conjugate acid. The one in pink here has lost the hydrogen, so that means it is acting as acid, and the hydroxide would be the base, the conjugate base. Now, if you couldn't follow along with that because you don't have different colored pens, um, a good way to kind of figure that out is looking at the reverse process. So you knew that water was in the acid and base because those were the only two gases. So one had to act as acid and the other had to act as base. So how did you know that the hydronium hydroxide is going to act the way that they do? Well, one, you could apply, you could just kind of think about it logically. When we talk about acids, we talk about hydronium. We talk about bases, we talk about hydroxide. That would be one way to go. The other way to go would be to look at, well, well how do they behave in the opposite direction? Well, the hydronium would be losing the hydrogen, so that acid behavior. The hydroxide would be gaining the hydrogen, so it would be when it comes to the table like this, um, again, I've, I've already told you three of the questions, so you're going to have a table similar to this on the exam on Wednesday. It'll have three different rows because there are three different questions. Um, of this time. To solve it, you're going to want to pull out that calculation box. And so what I would do is if I were looking at doing something like this top line, using that calculation box. First of all, from pH alone, I can determine its acidity. Its pH is less than seven, so I know it's acidic by definition. To determine hydronium and hydroxide, I can use 
different ideas on um, the relationship between pH, pOH, and the um, concentrations. So to find hydronium, 10 to the negative pH, so 10 to the negative 3.75 would give me hydronium. Which is uh, 1.8 times 10 to the negative 4. For hydroxide, I can either use this equation right here, or I could find the pOH and then do the exact calculation that I just did. Um, if I wanted to find the pOH, 14 minus 3.75 would give me 10.25, 10 to the negative 10.25, will give me hydroxide. It would be 5.6 times 10 to the negative 11. Now on the exam, I will give you space below the table to write out all of these calculations. So all you have to do is just put in the numbers in the table itself. Um, but here I didn't do that, so I'm just kind of showing you how I, I worked it along the way. Continuing on, looking at this second problem here, now we're starting with hydroxide concentration, and we need to turn it into hydronium and into pH. So uh, again, using our calculation box, You can see that to go from hydronium to hydroxide, we can use this equation right here. And what we can remember off of this, this is an equation that we did a couple of times, um, one times 10 to the negative 14th over hydronium equals hydroxide and 1 times 10 to the negative 14th over hydroxide equals hydronium. So since we have hydroxide, we can use the second one here. 1 times 10 to the negative 14th over 8.2 times uh, 10 to the negative 4th. And if I do that calculation, I would get 1.2 times 10 to the negative 11th. molar as the concentration. To find the pH, I would take the negative log of that. And that would give me 10.91. Which would lead to the, the conclusion that this is a basic solution. All right, similarly, we can do kind of the same thing with this third line here. One times 10 to the negative 14th over 9.54 times 10 to the negative ninth. That would give us 1.05 times 10 to the negative sixth.
pH will be the negative log of the hydroxide or the hydronium. 9.54 times 10 to the negative ninth. Which would give us 8.02. Zero, which would again be basic. And then <clears throat> um, the these calculations kind of just repeat themselves off of the top here. So um, 10 to the negative 9.21 would give me hydronium. So 6.2 times 10 to the negative tenth. I can find POH. Um, which would be uh, 5.79. And so 10 to the negative 5.79. would give me hydroxide, 1.6 times 10 to the negative sixth. This one's basic as well. It's got a basic pH. And then again, uh, this one mirrors the second one. So find hydronium. I take 1 times 10 to the negative 14th over 8.2 times 10 to the negative eighth. And that would give me 1.22 times 10 to the negative seventh. The log of that would give me the pH 6.914. And that is below 7, so it would be considered acidic. Although that is about as close to neutral as neutral can get for um, something that is, you know, technically considered. Uh, one way or the other. And then again, same kinds of things here. The, the hydronium concentration can be converted into hydroxide. So if I take one times 10 to the negative 14th and divide 0.345 times 10 to the negative sixth, uh, I would get 2.90 times 10 to the negative ninth, or excuse me, negative eighth. Find the pH, I would take the negative log of the uh, hydronium concentration. I get 6.462, which again would qualify as acidic, although barely. So when I'm looking at the table like this, you know, basically all I'm being asked to do is just move from one corner of this calculation square to another. And all I have to do is just follow the directions on the on the box. So if I want to go from hydronium to pH, I'm going to take the negative log of the hydronium. If I want to go from pH to hydronium, I take the anti-log of the negative pH. If I want to go from pH to pOH, I know that the two of them together have to equal 14. So 
Um, whatever one is, the other is what's left. Um, if I want to go from hydronium to hydroxide, this one of these equations will do. And if I want to go from pH to pOH or vice versa, basically I do the same thing as the uh, hydronium to pH for hydroxide to pOH. I just change out pH and pOH instead of, uh, um, or excuse me, I change out pOH for pH and hydroxide for hydronium. Okay, so let's look at some other calculations related. Um, and all of these follow from a very similar kind of pattern to, um, you know, what you're going to see on, on the exam. These are all um, basically titration reactions. And so all I need to do is if I am looking at my equation sheet, I need to pick up on this equation right here, the titration equation. Because this titration equation gives me exactly what I need um, and allows me to, to solve. So if 32.5 milliliters of 0.22 molar barium chloride is needed to react with 18 milliliters of this solution, what is the concentration of the solution? Using the titration equation, M1V1 over N1 is equal to M2V2 over N2. What I can look at here, and this is this is kind of important, is I can recognize, okay, the barium chloride, I know the molarity and the volume of, so let's just keep that on the, the one side. So the molarity was 0.22 molar, the volume was 32.5 milliliters. The coefficient on the barium is one. And for the copper chloride, we don't know its concentration, but we know that we had 18 milliliters of it and it's coefficient is two. So solving for M2, I'm going to need to multiply by two over 18 milliliters on both sides. When I do that, my everything cancels on the right hand side other than M2. Only milliliters cancel on the left-hand side. So 2 times 0.22 times 32 and a half divided by 18 will give us 0.79 molar for M2. So that tells us how concentrated the copper one acetate was. All right, number two seems to have a typo on it. Um, it says if 32.5 milliliters of 0.46 molar um, copper one acetate would need to completely react with 52.5 milliliters of barium chloride was the concentration of the calcium chloride. I believe that should be barium chloride. So we'll make that quick little fix there. Basically, we're looking at the exact same problem, though. So since we had this as the barium side the previous time, we'll keep it that way. M1 times 52.5 milliliters over one is equal to 0.46 molar times 32, yeah, 32 and a half milliliters over two. Um, this time I just need to multiply 
by one over 52 and a half milliliters to get it um, to balance out. All that is left is the milliliters and the calculation. So M1 is equal to 0.46 multiplied by 32.5 divided by 2 divided by 52 and a half. The two significant figures 0.14 more. All right, different reaction this time. Um, we've got uh, calcium hydroxide reacting with copper one nitrate to make copper one hydroxide and calcium nitrate. If 12 and a half milliliters of 0.46 molar copper one nitrate is needed to react completely with 22.5 milliliters of calcium hydroxide, what is the concentration of the calcium hydroxide? Same exact kind of problem. Um, all we just need to do is set it up. So since I have this information first, I'm going to use it. 0.46 molar calcium, or excuse me, copper one nitrate and 12 and a half milliliters of it. Coefficient for the copper is two. For the calcium, we don't know its concentration. We do know it's 22.5 milliliters. And we know that its coefficient is one. So to get it by itself, I need to multiply both sides by 1 over 22.5 milliliters. And milliliters will cancel on this side. Everything but M2 cancels on this side. So... 0.46 times 12 and a half divided by 22 and a half divided by 2 to two significant figures is 0.13 molar. So those technically aren't titrations. Um, which you've been told explicitly will be um, what is on the uh, exam itself. But the calculation for them is exactly the same, which is why they're good practice, and that's why they're on here. Now, in terms of, you know, the, what kinds of, of questions you could get asked about a titration, um, these two here are probably pretty close to the vest. They're also pretty close to what you saw in um in exam number two and um some of this is rehashing from exam number two so um we're hopefully going to see some improvement here as well all right big kind of takeaway here with with part a is you have to know what the substances are and you have to know how they react now if i look down Further in the problem, I can see that I've been given formulas for these two substances, which helps. So acetic acid is HC2H3O2, and calcium hydroxide is CaOH2. Um, neutralization reactions are double replacement reactions, so the hydrogen and the uh, calcium are going to switch places, so I'm going to end up with calcium acetate and hydrogen hydroxide, which we know better as water. Now, before I get into the balancing part of this, I got to make sure I have the chemical, the formulas correct. And the way that I want to do that is I want to look at do I know I have charge balance in each of these compounds? So I can look a little bit of guidance from the periodic table. So for example, I know that hydrogen is a positive one ion. 
And so since they are in an even relationship with acetate, that must mean acetate is negative one. Calcium is a positive two. It took two hydroxides to balance it. So a hydroxide must be negative one. And so even if I didn't know those offhand, because I didn't remember my polyatomic ions, I still have the context of knowing what the other ion is to help me out there. It's a double replacement reaction, so the charges do not change. And so we can see that in the case of the water, it's plus one and minus one. So that's why the formula is already correct. This one we can see is plus two and minus one. This one's incorrect. I'm going to need to correct the formula by doubling the number of acetates. Now I've got everything matched up. Now I can go about balancing this equation. The first thing I should notice is I have two acetates here, but only the one here. So I'm going to need a two there. And now I can see that I have two hydrogens and two hydroxides. So I should have two waters. And that balances out the equation. So here's my balanced chemical equation now. We've got a 30 milliliter sample of acetic acid and it required 27.85 milliliters of a 0.425 molar calcium hydroxide solution to neutralize. What is the concentration? Simple. It's the same equation that we were just using, but we're using the titration equation. So with that in mind, we know the most about the calcium. So we're going to put that first. 0.425 molar and 27.85 milliliters. The calcium coefficient is 1. For the acetic acid, we don't know its concentration. We do know that we have 30 milliliters of it. And that its coefficient, because we just balanced it, is 2. So we're going to need to multiply both sides by 2 over 30. to get the things that we need to cancel out, canceled out. So the only unit left over here is molarity. The only thing left over here is just the unknown. Two times 0.425 times 27.85 divided by 30 to three significant figures would be 0.789 molar. For the next one, write the balanced chemical equation for the reaction between phosphoric acid and potassium hydroxide. We've got a similar kind of thing going on here as well need a balanced chemical equation first. So I need to know what the things are. Phosphoric acid is H3PO4. It's been given to us there. Potassium hydroxide is KOH. And so again, using the periodic table for clues, we know that hydrogen is positive one and there are three of them. So overall, this is a positive three charge. There's only one phosphate, but it's got a match charges, so it must be negative three. Potassium is positive one. Hydroxide must be negative one as a result. And if we go to the products, we're going to see potassium and phosphate. And we're going to see hydrogen and hydroxide, which again, we know better as water. Now, the question is, what is the formulas? Are we correct? Potassium is positive one. The phosphate was negative three. So I'm going to need three potassiums to balance that out. And hydrogen is positive one. Hydroxide is negative one. So they balance each other already. It's done from that standpoint. Now we just need to match up and, and figure out 
the uh, pieces and parts here. So um, I can look here, I can see that I need three potassiums. So I'm going to get three potassium hydroxides from that. I need three hydrogens and three hydroxides. So that would mean three waters as well. So now we've got all of that arranged. We've got the balanced equation. Now we're just looking for pretty much, again, the same thing. We're, we're trying to find the molarity of the acid. So again, using the titration equation here, we know the most about the hydroxide. So that's what we'll do. 0.425 molar potassium hydroxide. That's 37.85 milliliters. The coefficient on KOH this time is three. And on the flip side, we have an unknown concentration of acid, 25 milliliter sample, and its coefficient is one as well. So each side needs to be multiplied by one over 25. which we get milliliters to cancel out and everything else to cancel out on that side. So 0.425 times 37.85 divided by 25 divided by three to three significant figures, 0.214 molar. All right, so that's the solutions half of the exam. And again, you, you can kind of see the, the majority of the calculations fall into basically the two categories here. The calculation box where we're converting between pH, pOH, hydronium and hydroxide, and titration equation, ah, excuse me, titration equation um, calculations where we're just using the same formula over and over and over again. We just need to make sure that we've got the correct um, balanced equation and that we've got the correct chemical formulas. All right, moving into gases, there are going to be a couple of questions um, possible about pressure. And so some of the, the questions you might see would be just conversions of pressure. And for that, what you really want to call down on and, and think about is there is a conversion between right here, one atmosphere is 760 torr or 760 millimeters mercury. One bar is 0.9869 atmospheres. Uh, should that come up? But you can see that we're being asked to convert our millimeters of mercury into atmospheres. So starting with those millimeters of mercury, we know that there are 760 millimeters of mercury in one atmosphere. Millimeters cancel. 1068 divided by 760 to three significant figures uh, would be 1.41 atmospheres. And of course we can flip that around, 4.35 atmospheres. Every atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury. So 4.35 times 760 would give you 3,310 millimeters of mercury. So that's one thing that you can be asked is just how to do pressure conversions. The majority of the questions, however, are probably going to be about the gas laws themselves and the relationship between the variables. And so questions like these next several are going to be more important and useful. At constant temperature, we have a sample of helium at 7.2 atmospheres in a closed container. It is compressed from 10 to 3 liters. What is the new pressure of the helium? 
So pressure and volume being compared, that is Boyle's law. So we want to look for the right gas law, the one that de deals just in pressure and volume. And that one does. So P1V1 is equal to P2V2. And our pressure in the initial case is 7.20 atmospheres at 10 liters. And our final volume is 3 liters. And we don't know what the final pressure is because that's what we're trying to figure out. We need to get P by itself. So we need to divide each side by 3 liters. The liters cancel. All that we're left with is pressure. 7.2 times 10 divided by 3 will give you 24.0 atmospheres. And this should make sense. Um, since pressure and volume are inversely related, when we compress it down by 70%, we're going to see that it is going to increase in pressure by 70% as well. And that's what happened here. We went from 7.2 to 24. Mm. And so... The container collapsed to less than one third of its size, which means that the pressure would have gone up by more than three um, to keep that inverse relationship. What is the final volume of a balloon that was initially 700 milliliters at 25.5 degrees Celsius and then heated to 82.6? So this is a Charles law problem. We're looking at volume and temperature. Thing to remember, important thing to consider, these temperatures are in Celsius. We need to turn them into Kelvin. To do that, we need to add 273 to them. So 82.6 plus 273 would give me 355.6 Kelvin. Twenty-five point five degrees Kelvin plus two seventy-three would give you two hundred ninety-eight point five Kelvin. So we're using Charles' law: V one over T one equals V two over T two. So V one was seven hundred milliliters at 298.5 Kelvin. And we're looking for what is the new volume when we bring it up to 355.6 Kelvin. To isolate, we need to multiply each side by 355.6 Kelvin. Now we'll get rid of the one side. Now we'll get rid of Kelvin on the other. So our new volume would be 700 times 355.6 divided by 298.5. And to four significant figures, that comes out to 833.9. And that would be milliliters. And again, you know, the question you always want to ask with problems like this is, does it make sense? Does this seem to fit? We raise the temperature, we should expect the balloon to expand, and it shows that it is expanding. So at the very worst, we're, we're heading in the right direction.
right? So more gas laws, if the volume of gas chain at 32 changes from 1.55 liters to 755 milliliters, what would the final temperature be? So same kind of problem. Um, we're still doing Charles Law. We just need to turn 32 Celsius into Kelvin. 32 plus 273 is 305.0 Kelvin. The other problem that we have here is that we have a unit mismatch. We've got liters for one unit and milliliters for the other. Um, you just have to convert one to the other. I'll convert this real quick because the sliding the decimal divided by a thousand is pretty easy. So 0.755 liters instead of 755 milliliters. So we have 1.55 liters over 305 Kelvin. And we're trying to see what happens when we get 0.75 liters. What is the second temperature? Lots of ways to solve this. Um, the way I prefer most is since I have a variable in the denominator here, um, what I'm going to do is flip both fractions at the same time so that the variables in the numerator, uh, and then it'll solve just like the previous problem before it. So if I, if I do that, and flip this around, So just doing some readjusting here. Now this works out exactly the same way as the previous one did. I just need to multiply to get rid of T2. In the process, liters will cancel over here. Everything will cancel over here. 0.755 times 305 divided by 1.55. Two, three significant figures would be 149 Kelvin. And so to get a change that drastic, where we are um, more than cutting the volume in half, you would have to more than cut the temperature of the room in half as well. Um, for question six, um, if each of the following gas samples have the same temperature and pressure, which has the greatest volume? This is not a trick question, but it's a simple question that needs to think about Avogadro's law. Avogadro's law says that um, equal numbers of moles will take up the same volume. Well, if I have unequal numbers of moles, the thing that has greater number of moles will take up more um, space. So if I take my gram of helium and I convert it, And then let's just say that we're at STP. If we're not at STP, it really doesn't matter. Um, the value would just be different. 
So 1 times 22.4 divided by 4 would be 5.6 liters. For the oxygen, molar mass of oxygen is 32. And again, if we're at the same temperature and pressure conditions, the volumes will be exactly the same. So even if I'm not at STP, if I'm still at the same temperature and pressure, I know that it's not 22.4, but it is the same for each gas. One times 22.4 divided by 32 is 0.7 liters. So the helium is going to take up far less space or far more space than the oxygen because it's a lighter gas and it has a lower molar mass. And so if all other things are held constant, there's going to be more particles per gram of helium than of oxygen because helium is a lighter gas. Okay. Finally, gas phase reactions, the stuff that we were talking about at the beginning of class today and kind of finished up from on Friday. Um, again, notice that um, for the first three here, all of the conditions are at STP. So if I'm doing a chemical reaction manipulation, STP is the only thing I need to worry about and care about. And at STP, 22.4 liters is equal to one mole. So when I get into a question like this, how many liters of water are produced from 50 liters at excess oxygen at STP? Well, I can do a pretty standard kind of calculation where I'm going to go from liters of propane to moles. to moles of ox of uh, water and then finally to liters of water you know, since water is in the vapor phase here. Now this step right here, this is your basic stoichiometry. I just used the balanced chemical equation. For these conversions between volume and moles um, for gases, this is where I'm going to use the Avogadro-Molar relationship, 22.4 liters in every mole. From here, one mole of propane is equivalent to four moles of water, and one mole of water is 22.4 liters in volume. Now, one important thing I want you to notice here, really important. If my stoichiometry takes me from gas to gas at STP, look what's happened here. I'm dividing by 22.4 here and then multiplying by 22.4 here. I can negate those. In a case where I'm going for doing stoichiometry from gas to gas at the same conditions, the relationship between the two is all about the mole relationship. And so the correct answer is whatever the answer of, of uh, 50 times 4 is, and that would be 200 liters of water. 4 times 50 is 200. Same thing, gas phase reaction. Um, if I'm going from gas to gas, I really just need the mole to mole ratio. So 25.0 liters of carbon dioxide. And... Um, for every three moles of carbon dioxide, I need five moles of oxygen. 
So 25 times 5 divided by 3 to three significant figures, 41.7 liters of oxygen. Now let's just assume, because uh, I can see that the next question is also very, very similar. So let's just make a slight adjustment here. How many grams of propane are needed to produce 55 liters of carbon dioxide? In this particular case, I can't just skip and use the mole ratio. I am going to have to do the whole thing. So I'm going from liters of carbon dioxide to moles. Moles of carbon dioxide to moles of propane. And then finally, moles of propane to grams. So for this, I'm going to need a more traditional stoichiometry. So 55.0 liters of carbon dioxide. I can still use the Avogadro step, 22.4 liters in one mole. And now I need to do more traditional stoichiometry. So I gotta go moles of carbon dioxide into moles of propane. Carbon dioxide's coefficient is three, propane's is one. So, Last step, one mole of propane. You need to turn that into grams. Carbon is 12.01 times three. Hydrogen is 1.01 .01 times eight, 44.11. So now we put it all together. 55 times 44.11 divided by 22.4 divided by 3 to three significant figures. It is 36.1 grams of propane. All right, and then finally, last question on the study guide. Um, very similar to a question that we did at the end of class on Friday. Um, we've got a 2.45 liter container. It contains 1.25 grams of an unknown gas. At a particular pressure and temperature, notice that those conditions are not STP conditions, so I cannot use the Avogadro relationship. I need to use the ideal gas law. So we want to know the molecular weight of the gas. For that, we need to do grams divided by moles. But before we can get to that spot, we need to know the number of moles. So just remembering our ideal gas law, if I want to isolate N, I need to divide both sides by RT. So N is equal to PV over RT. The pressure was 4.225 atmospheres. The volume was 2.45 liters. R, so we need the atmospheres version. That would be this one, 0.0821. Liter atmospheres over moles Kelvin. And 95 degrees, remember we need to turn that into Kelvin. So plus 273, 273 plus 95 is 368 Kelvin. So when I do this calculation, 4.225 times 2.45 divided by 0.0821, Divide by 368, 
I get to three significant figures, 0.343. Molecular weight is grams over moles. The grams were given to us, 1.25. The moles we just calculated, 0.343. And we get 3.64 grams per mole as the molar mass for this particular gas, which I don't know what that is. Um, that appears to be a little bit... Um, a little bit undersized. Let's make sure we didn't do a math mistake here. No, we did not. So ah, this is what happens when you uh, use a, a book or when you use a question that is not out of your book and one that you made off the top of your head. Happens from time to time. Um, but nonetheless, this would be, even though we get a, a nonsense answer for this, this would be what you needed to do to, to calculate a problem like that. And again, I wouldn't be surprised to see a question almost exactly like this on the exam on Wednesday because it's a really great application of the ideal gas law. So all told, this is the entire study guide. And so um, what I will be doing is this video obviously will be paired up on YouTube because that's where you're watching it right now. But this, um, guide with all the answers, this key will be up in Blackboard as well so that you can download it and compare your results to mine. So please feel free to reach out to me over the next couple of days if you run into any kind of trouble or if you want some further clarification of things. But otherwise, I will see you next time in class and good luck and happy studying.